I'm here with Suzanne Samard in Pacific Spirit Park, uh, approximately a kilometer from the farm site and also quite close to some urban development. You may be able to hear hammering and construction in the background because uh, we are just um, down the road from UBC and in increasing housing and development for that. And we are in a forest. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the climate which uh, has impacted this forest. Okay, well we're really close to the Pacific Ocean, only maybe a couple of kilometers. And so this climate is strongly influ influenced by the ocean, of course. It's a, a maritime climate, um, a mild mar maritime climate, where there's lots of precipitation um, here about a couple hundred centimeters a year and the temperatures are also very mild, so mean annual temperature is upwards to 10, 10 degrees Celsius. That means that there's, uh, there aren't any harsh winters, there's, the, the soils never freeze, um, sometimes there's snow but it doesn't hang around for long and there's very little of it. Um, also in the summertime, on the flip side, we can, we can, because we're at the southern end of the province, get strong um, moisture deficits in the summertime. So, you know, it's not, it's not the wettest part of the maritime, it's probably at the drier end. Um, and so we actually call this the dry maritime climate for this particular forest type. All right. And can you elaborate a little bit about what types of trees or plants we would be likely to find in this dry maritime forest and, and how it all pieces together? Sure. Um, so. Uh, most of the, the forests that are in BC are, are near climax. That means that they're at fairly uh, further, quite far along in succession. And so the forests here have been actually classified based on uh, their climatic climax characteristics. So the forest composition here, because of its stage of succession, which is not quite climax in this case, um, it does actually reflect the climate. So this mild maritime climate, trees that typically grow here are uh, western hemlock and western red cedar, um, and then in earlier successional stages also Douglas fir. So we call it the coastal western hemlock forest because throughout um, these forest types throughout the province, uh, western hemlock is prevalent throughout and it reflects the regional climate. If we wanted to contrast it with say a, a much drier climate, if you go into the interior where precipitation drops off dramatically, we get very different forests that reflect that climate. So where we have strong summer um, droughts, for example, we get ponderosa pine, which reflect the climax forest. But here it's western hemlock because it's a mild maritime uh, climate. Okay. What about uh, the plants in the understory uh, that we might see here? Okay, um, so the plants are also reflecting the climate uh -huh. uh, in, a, in a large degree, but they're also reflecting site characteristics. Okay. So <clears throat> the western hemlock that we see, just to bring that back up in scale a little bit, um, those are typical of what we call mesic sites. We're on a mesic site, or roughly mesic site here, and the plants here reflect that mesic site. If we were to go to a drier site, we would see quite a different assemblage of plants, and, or on a wetter site, yet another a different assemblage of plants. But the plants here are reflecting this maritime climate on a mesic site. Let's go back to talking about succession. Could you elaborate a little bit about that, please? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it in the context of this forest. Mm -hmm. There's a very interesting disturbance history in this forest. Um, when Vancouver was being settled back in the mid-1800s, this area was gradually logged from, you know, Granville Street outwards to Point Grey. And a lot of the logging that went on were these little jippo op operators um, who would log out small portions and eventually that all coalesced until, you know, large parts of this area were logged. And they had little fires that were burning big slash piles and eventually um, some of these fires started to escape and there was a, a very large fire in the early 1900s um, which basically burned out this whole area. It was a fairly severe fire and uh, so that set this uh, forest back to in sec secondary succession to the initial stage of, the, of sec secondary succession where there's there are really very few veteran trees left after the fire. Um, one thing that they did right after the fire is they came in and they, they salvage logged the area. 
And so you can actually see some of the stumps in the forest uh, and if you look very carefully at the tops of the stumps you can see that, that they're not burned whereas the, the outsides are indicating that it was logged after the fire. So, um, so really we started from very little uh, trees left on the site and uh, early successional species like Douglas fir and red alder came in and, and occupied the site. And all the pattern of succession in these forests largely is we call it an initial uh, floristic succession where everything seeds in together more or less within about a 20 year period. And generally that happened and we, what we see here is a fairly even age forest where later successional tree species, cedar and hemlock established relatively at the same time and have slowly grown up through the understory. Eventually, as the Douglas fir starts to drop out of the stand, and already red alder has dropped out of the stand for the most part, Douglas fir, after about 500 years, will start to drop out of the stand, and ultimately, if there are no further disturbances, this should uh, succeed to a cedar hemlock forest in the later parts of succession, or the climax phase. So at this stage here, we still got a lot of Douglas fir. It's, it's about a, um, 100 years old, or a little bit less than that. And, and all of the cedar and the hemlock are the same age because they all relatively started at the same time. So we're not, we're sort of in this uh, mature, um, serial stage of, of, of development, stand development. So as I said, this area is a park and it's managed in a managed forest in some ways. Can you elaborate a little bit on some of the uses and things that go on here? Sure. Um, I, first of all, I want to just distinguish this managed forest concept. This park is really unique in that it doesn't follow the typical management pathway that we think about when we think of managed forests in BC. Um, following commercial harvesting, for example, most of our forests are actually planted. This forest was natu naturally regenerated from seed from the neighboring trees that were left after the fire in the early 1900s. So when we look at the forest, we see this irregular or random distribution of trees, whereas in a plantation you see a more regular distribution of trees in certain tree species. So this forest, you could consider it like it's very pristine, it's very unique for an urban area to have such a, a beautiful example of a naturally regenerated forest. Some groups use this forest for various things, right, in the typical park setting. Right, so there's little low levels of disturbances from recreation use of the forest. So for example, we can see a trail behind us which joggers will use and dogs and other pets um, are walk through the park. Other than that though, and other than the urban or the urban development that's encroaching on the edges of the park, this forest is really not disturbed uh, in any other sense, except through other natural disturbances which happen in every forest. For example, you know, we talked about how this forest was initially disturbed by fire and this set us back early in secondary succession and we've got uh, succession beyond that. Um, there's other small, gap, what we call gap phase disturbances happening at the same time throughout succession. They're not huge disturbances, but they're subtle. For example, we've got various uh, pathogens in this forest. There's a, uh, a little bit of Felinus root rot, for example, just small patches, um, which cause little patches to go back in succession um, in those isolated spatial areas. There's a little bit of dwarf mistletoe on hemlock, which is causing some of the individual hemlocks to eventually die and open up the forest. There's some wind throw for sure, especially in the wetter areas. So that makes the forest very uh, irregular and, and diverse, really spatially diverse. I'd like to know a little bit more about these small level disturbances. Okay, um, in this forest we can see the legacy of a lot of these small level disturbances. Um, one example are snags, which are basically standing dead trees. We see some of those snags have fallen on the floor, forest floor, and then there's also these old stumps. So if we look at this stump, for example, um, it, was, it was once a snag, and you can see this old cut here where after the fire and they came in and salvage logged around 1920, that, that's where this cut would have originated from. So they took off the top part of that tree. Since then, um, this is a, a recent cut that would have been cut when they developed this trail right behind us for recreational use. So we can actually, you know, if we 
did some sort of dating, we could figure out how long ago this cut was made exactly and then how long ago this cut was made, which was probably when the park was developed. So um, these, you know, all these snags and the coarse woody debris, they really do tell a story about the history of the forest, of the disturbance history of the forest. And then they also contribute, of course, to the functioning of the forest. Coarse woody debris plays a role in regeneration, it plays a role in um, habitat for small mammals, for birds, and it plays a, a really important role in nutrient cycling.